Look it. Look it. Look it. Boom, boom, boom. Sometimes you feel like there needs to be more instruction manuals in the world. Although it's kind of embarrassing when you realize you need a manual to figure out how to use a spoon or a toilet seat cover. But the truth is, most of us are totally clueless about the real uses of the things that we actually use every day. This is what I do, but this is a no no. These are not how these are designed. From the humble bobby pin to the mysterious drawer under your oven. Here, are 20 everyday things you have been using wrong. <sighs> Number 20, bobby pin. Bobby pins are undeniably one of the go-to beauty tools for taming your hair. They're usually right there when you need them to keep everything in place. Unless you really actually need one, then it's basically the most difficult thing to find ever. What sets a bobby pin apart from other hairpins is its design. While regular hairpins have open ends and are often used for styles with more volume and texture, bobby pins are made for better control. Their ends have ridges and are closed, allowing them to hold hair securely against the head. So, which way should you use a bobby pin? To get a stronger grip, aim the ridged side toward your scalp. This orientation also ensures the hair flows in the intended direction. While a single bobby pin can sometimes do the trick, they usually work best in pairs for added staying power. And don't think one size fits all. There are also thicker bobby pins designed for more robust hair types. Here's a quick tip before sliding that pin into your hair. Give it a spritz of hairspray. Doing so will make it adhere better and hold your hairstyle in place more effectively. If you have found yourself tearing your hair out because you can't find a bobby pin when you need one, Give us a like and hit subscribe. We're all in this together. Time for the rare topic. Emily was a real world traveler and she was always looking for her next adventure. On a long haul flight to Australia, she noticed the man sitting behind her did something kind of weird to say the least. After settling into his seat, the man pulled the cloth cover from the headrest and draped it over his face like an eye mask. <laughs> a real WTF moment. Anyway. Emily took a sneaky photo and later posted it online. The image went viral and some people were up in arms about this revolution in travel technique. Some thought it was a brilliant life hack for comfortable sleep during travel, as it prevents the head from flopping to one side. Others argued that it was an improper use of the cloth cover, meant only for hygiene and cleanliness. Sorry. After landing, Emily struck up a conversation with the man whose name was Tim. He explained that he'd been using the cloth cover as an eye mask for years. It's my little travel secret, he said. Makes any coach seat feel like first class. Months later, Emily found herself on another journey. Remembering Tim's trick, she gave it a try. Just like that, she was sold, forever changing the way she traveled. Do you think Tim's use of the cloth cover as an eye mask is a clever travel hack or a misuse of the item? Would you consider trying this trick the next time you travel by coach or plane? Comment down below with the hashtag rare topic and let us know your opinion in relation to what we just showed on screen. With that said, let's keep things moving. Number 19, the drawer under the oven. Many people are puzzled about the purpose of that drawer under their oven. Some think it's for storage. Some believe it's a broiler and others reckon it's a warming drawer. Honestly, it could be any of these depending on your oven's make and model. Wondering if you have a warming drawer? Just take a look at your oven's buttons. If one is labeled warming drawer, <laughs> then you've got one. This feature is handy for reheating things like pie or bread. You can also use it to keep some dishes warm while you finish cooking the rest of your meal. If your oven runs on natural gas, that space is likely a broiler. A quick peek should confirm it. If the drawer looks more like a sliding out pan than a box, it's for broiling. Think of it as a bonus cooking space, ideal for toasting or browning items like bread and casseroles. Just be cautious, things can burn quickly in there. So keep an eye out, checking every couple of minutes. If the drawer is deep and empty with no buttons indicating it's for warming, it's probably a storage space. It's a good place to keep your cast iron pots and pans as the oven's heat helps prevent rust. Just steer clear of storing anything plastic down there as the heat from the oven could cause it to warp. Number 18, laundry detergent. You open your dryer, expecting a load of soft, fluffy clothes, only to find that they feel more like cardboard. 
what gives? Well, it might be because you're going overboard with the laundry detergent. A little detergent is great for lifting stains and grime, but too much can create a whole new set of problems. If your previously soft clothes now feel stiff and scratchy, there could be a reason. It's maybe due to detergent residue that didn't wash out. Excessive suds from too much detergent can also prevent your clothes from rubbing together. This is not good because this is how they get clean in the first place. Counterintuitive as it may sound, using more soap can actually make your clothes dirtier. According to laundry experts, approximately 30 milliliters of detergent are plenty for a big five kilogram load. For a regular three kilogram load, approximately 15 milliliters should do the trick. And if you're washing by hand, remember this, a little detergent goes a long way. Number 17, peanut butter. Back in the day, choosing peanut butter was a simple decision, smooth or crunchy. Now there's a new question on the block. Should you go for natural peanut butter or stick with the traditional kinds? Many people lean towards natural peanut butter because its ingredient list is pretty straightforward. Just peanuts, maybe a pinch of salt. On the other hand, regular peanut butter often includes extras like added sugar and processed vegetable oils. Ugh. Here's a nifty trick for keeping your natural peanut butter nice and spreadable. Just flip the jar upside down. Since the oil in natural peanut butter tends to separate, this method ensures it doesn't always sit on top. By leaving the jar upside down, you allow the oil to gradually migrate to the other end. When you turn the jar right side up again to use the peanut butter, the oil will evenly disperse, preventing dry or clumpy spots and keeping the texture smooth. No heavy stirring needed. This trick works like a charm for other seed and nut butters too, like tahini. Number 16, pasta spoon. I can't help but love pasta. If you're also a pasta fan, you might have wondered, what's the deal with the hole in the middle of my pasta spoon? Surely it's just a water strainer, right? Wrong. Actually, that hole serves as a neat serving size guide. Not a lot of people realize that the amount of long pasta that fits through that hole is roughly one serving. I can't vouch for its accuracy with elbow macaroni, but for long pasta, it's a pretty smart hack. Given that pasta has been around for ages, it makes sense that such clever tricks exist. As for the dish's history, it likely gained popularity in Italy due to the bustling trade in the Mediterranean during the Middle Ages. By the 1300s, Italians were buzzing about pasta dishes like macaroni, ravioli, gnocchi, and vermicelli. In his 1400s collection of tales, the Decameron Boccaccio even writes about a dream of a mountain of Parmesan cheese where chefs roll macaroni and ravioli down to eager diners. Dried pasta became a big hit in the 1400s and 1500s since it was easy to store. This was handy for ships exploring the new world. In the 1600s, tomatoes arrived in Italy, although they didn't make their way into pasta sauces until the late 1800s. Before that, pasta was eaten sauce-free, often just picked up with fingers. <laughs> Once sauces came into play, forks became kind of necessary. Number 15, trash bags. So, you thought you knew how to put a trash bag in a can, right? Turns out there's a more efficient way to do it, and it's surprisingly simple. First off, you don't need to do that loud shake. To open the bag, simply place the open edge of the drawstring over the top rim of the trash can, as if it were a hat. Then, push the bag down into the can to eliminate any trapped air, making more space for your trash. The end result, pretty much the same as always, but with two noteworthy improvements. First, you'll realize that most trash bags are actually inside out. And then you're actually gonna push it down. When you first pull them out of the box, just check the seam. Following this method flips the bag right side out. Second, you avoid the ear piercing noise that comes with shaking open a new bag. Trust me, babies everywhere will be grateful. Number 14, box grater. The internet has done it again offering us a fresh take on using a classic kitchen tool, the four-sided cheese grater or box grater. Instead of holding it upright, lay it flat on a table or countertop. Then you can grate the cheese side to side and not up and down. This approach is way easier on your arms. It also keeps the grater stable. If you want to make it even smoother, there's another neat trick in the locker. 
Try spraying the outer surface of the grater with cooking spray. This is especially helpful for stickier cheeses. This grating technique is blowing up on social media right now, so if you haven't heard of it, you're not alone. Another advantage is that the cheese collects inside the grater. This makes it way easier to gauge how much you've shredded. For example, this can be handy if you're not grating directly into a large mixing bowl. How about one more tip for your cheesy endeavors? Use an old toothbrush to clean out those tiny grater holes. Number 13, ketchup cups. Ah, uh, why didn't I think of this sooner? When you're at McDonald's ordering fries, you usually find yourself making multiple trips to the ketchup dispenser or juggling several little ketchup cups for the family. It's a minor hassle, but even more so when you get those big potato wedges at KFC and end up wasting ketchup at the bottom of the cup. A guy with the jokey name Russian Hacker has revealed that you can actually expand these cups. By pulling the cup's sides, you can triple its ketchup holding capacity. He even demonstrates fitting the contents of two cups into one expanded cup. Handy tip if fast food is a regular part of your lunch routine. A little ketchup history for you before tomatoes took center stage. Mushrooms were the primary ingredient in British ketchup. The term ketchup first appeared in 1682, and by the 18th century, ketchup recipes were showing up in both British and American cookbooks. Mushroom ketchup was a thing in the United States as early as 1770, introduced by British colonists in the 13 colonies. But as the 20th century rolled on, tomato ketchup started gaining more love in the US. Interestingly, ketchup was embraced well before fresh tomatoes were, likely because people felt safer eating tomatoes in a processed form combined with spices and vinegar. Number 12, Tic Tacs. Since their debut in 1969, Tic Tacs have pretty much been a global favorite. Need quick, fresh breath? Just pop one in. Or you can go my route and eat six at a time because, well, why not? But let's dig a bit deeper. What else do you know about these little flavored mints? If your answer is not much, you've come to the right place. The Italian confectionery giant Ferrero is behind Tic Tacs, as well as Nutella, Kinder Chocolate, and Rocher. But mixing Tic Tacs and Nutella? Probably not a good idea. Originally, these mints were humbly named Refreshing Mints, not the most imaginative title. Thankfully, they switched to the more catchy Tic Tac in 1970, a name inspired by the sound the mints make inside their plastic case. The little divot under the top flap is designed so you can shake out a single mint if you're into moderation. I, for one, prefer my Tic Tacs by the handful. The amaranth red dye used in the grape flavor was once found to contain a possible carcinogen, but fear not. Grape Tic Tacs made a comeback in 2014 and are now considered safe to consume. And for those living the gluten-free life, good news, Tic Tacs are gluten-free, so you can munch away without a worry. Number 11, Post-its. The day I learned the correct way to peel off a Post-it note, it felt like a revelation. Seriously, this tip is a game changer. I'm pretty sure most of us have used Post-its or sticky notes at some point, and I'd bet that the majority of us peel them from top to bottom off. You grab a pad of sticky notes, clutch a bottom corner that's free of adhesive, and yank the sheet upward. But that approach has a flaw. When you peel the note from bottom to top, one corner or the top end tends to curl up. This can cause the post-it to lose its stickiness and potentially fall off the surface you've just attached it to. That reminder to call your mom on her birthday might just end up on the floor. So how about a post-it life hack that's currently making the rounds online? Here's the deal, you should actually peel the sticky note off from the top adhesive part of the pad, not the bottom. To do this, slide your fingers under the left side of the paper and gently ease them under the sticky portion. Then pull the post-it upwards in a straight line. The note will stay flat and the corner won't curl up like it usually does. Genius! Take a moment to absorb this crucial life hack if you need to, it's worth it. Number 10, aluminum foil. Aluminum foil is a staple in most households, serving a range of purposes from grilling to cooking foil packet recipes. Yet it comes with a little enigma. One side of the foil is shiny, while the other is more matte. Even the packaging doesn't give any clues about these differences in appearance. So how should you use it for covering your casserole? Shiny side up or shiny side down? Before you tear off another sheet, here's the scoop. When you unroll aluminum foil, you'll notice one side gleams brightly, almost like a mirror, while the other side is much less reflective. This isn't just random, there's actually a reason behind it. 
the variance in appearance results from the manufacturing process. Aluminum foil is created in layers, and to make it thin enough for household use, it's stretched using heat and tension. During production, two sheets are manufactured simultaneously to ensure they're robust enough to not tear easily. One side of the foil ends up touching another layer, making it appear dull, while the side that doesn't touch any other layers stays shiny. Despite their different looks, both sides are made from the same material. So, now that you're clued in on why one side is shiny and the other is not, you might still wonder which side should face up or down when you use it. The simple answer, it doesn't really make a difference. Number nine, bananas. Most of us peel bananas from the stem down, thinking that's what the stem is designed for. But hold on, there's another way you should really be peeling the banana. Surprisingly, the best way is actually from the bottom up. If you're skeptical, consider that monkeys, the experts in banana consumption, also opt for this method. They don't struggle with their food like we sometimes do. To do it right, flip the banana so the stem is on the bottom, then pinch the bumpy tip of the fruit between your thumb and index finger. You should be able to do this without causing any mess. Now just peel the skin away in a circle around the banana. Take a moment to appreciate how effortless that was. No mush, no bruises, no mess. If you're not convinced or just don't want to hear life advice from a chimpanzee, that's fine. You can stick to the traditional method, but you'll likely miss out on the top few centimeters of the potassium-rich fruit. The rest of us will enjoy our bananas in their full glory. It's a small shift in habit, but one that could be significant for banana lovers everywhere. Number eight, Chinese food box. Ever wonder how so much food fits into those compact white boxes from your Chinese takeout place? Sure, you could use a fork or chopsticks to pick at your Kung Pao chicken right from the box, or if you're really hungry, you could dump the whole thing onto a plate. If the latter sounds like you, here's a tip. You can save on cleanup time by unfolding the takeout box and using it as a plate. These iconic, nearly leak-proof containers were actually an American invention from the late 1800s, drawing inspiration from the Japanese art of origami. If something can be folded, it can also be unfolded. So before diving into your meal, consider spreading your food out on the flat surface of the unfolded box. This reduces the number of dishes you'll need to wash afterward. Your food will also heat up more evenly when it's spread out. Plus, it's a convenient way to serve food to a group without everyone craning their necks to peek into those tiny little boxes. As for the environment, these boxes have a wax coating to keep liquids from seeping into the cardboard. This makes them reusable for storing other foods. They also keep your food warmer for a longer time due to their tight sealing nature. It's a win-win all around. Number seven, can openers. Most of us probably open cans the way we've always known, which is similar to using a hole punch. You grab your handheld can opener, clamp it down on the lid, then turn the crank until you've cut a full circle around the can. Usually this makes the lid fall inside the can, and then you have to carefully fish it out. Let's call this method A. However, there's a new way to do this that seems to be changing canned goods opening worldwide. Instead of clamping down on the inside edge of the lid, you put your can opener against the side of the can. As you go around the lid, you might notice the can doesn't wobble as much. We'll dub this method B, and it's worth trying. So what's the key difference between the lids made using method A and method B? The lid from method A tends to be sharp, making it somewhat risky to remove. On the other hand, method B produces a lid with a smoother edge, which is a lot safer to handle. Plus, the lid comes off still attached to the can opener, so you don't even have to touch it. For someone who worries about slicing a finger open while trying to get a can of dog food open, this is a big deal. Even if it's not my biggest life concern, it's still a relief. Number six, pistachios. And voila, there's your open pistachio. Pistachios are a versatile snack. You can enjoy anytime and incorporate into a variety of recipes. You can mix them in ice cream, sprinkle them on cake, or even use them to give chicken an added crunch. Getting those little nuts out of their shells, however, can be a little bit tricky and messy. While some resort to using their teeth or tearing at the shells, there's an easier way. Just give them a squeeze. I used to think you'd practically have to sacrifice a fingernail to get the job done. And let's not forget the tales of people almost breaking their teeth while trying to open those stubborn shells. 
but what's a pistachio experience without a near dental disaster? Am I right? Am I right? For those extra stubborn pistachios that are completely sealed, there's still hope. You can use half of another shell to pry it open. So the next time you're struggling with a tricky pistachio, remember these handy tips. Number five, potato peeler. Remember how kitchen gadgets are supposed to make life simpler? Well, there's one basic tool, the potato peeler that many of us haven't been using to its full advantage. Even if you thought your peeler felt a bit wobbly, it probably did cost you only a buck 75 at Walmart. That's actually by design and understanding why could be your shortcut to peeling potatoes more efficiently. The reason for the wiggly blade is that it allows the peeler to swivel back and forth this gives you the freedom to move it up and down the potato. You don't have to stick to a single direction, lifting the peeler off the spud each time before starting from the top again. Instead, you can go up and down continuously. This enables you to peel the entire potato swiftly by moving the peeler both downward and forward without needing to lift off. Some potato people have pointed out that this method might be a bit risky when it comes to potential cuts. I see their point. The upward motion does require a bit more control over the blade and the positioning of your fingers, but when you use this technique, the blade stays in contact with the potato, reducing the chances of cutting yourself. Number four, plunger. People are just now catching on through Instagram that not all plungers are created equal, and using the wrong one might be why your toilet keeps clogging. You likely have a standard cup plunger at home, which is actually meant for sinks and drains, not toilets. If placed on a flat surface, its rubber cup seals the drain well and creates the vacuum needed to clear a clog. But a toilet's curves make it tricky for this kind of plunger to seal properly. So this item is the flange plunger, which is specifically designed for toilets. It has a rubber flap that can seal off the toilet chain creating the vacuum necessary to tackle that clog. Plus, you can fold the flap in to convert it into a regular plunger for sinks. For stubborn toilet clogs that won't budge, there's also the accordion plunger. It might be a bit tricky to handle at first, but once you get the hang of it, it forms a powerful seal to really get things moving. Now, you're equipped with the know-how to choose the right plunger for the job. Number three, toothpaste. Toothpaste is also something we use daily, but probably don't think about much. We all know the drill, brush your teeth twice a day. But how many of us wonder, how much toothpaste should I really use? It's a valid question, given that we're all trying to maintain our oral health. Contrary to popular belief, it's actually your toothbrush that does the heavy lifting when it comes to cleaning your teeth. Toothpaste may have some abrasive properties that assist in scrubbing, but its primary role is to freshen your breath so it's fair to say that a lot of us are probably using too much toothpaste daily. Toothpaste manufacturers often depict a generous dollop of toothpaste on the brush in their advertising. It's a clever move by them. The more toothpaste we use, the more we'll buy. However, the ideal amount is much less than you might think. A pea-sized amount is all you really need. Excessive toothpaste doesn't do much in terms of actual cleaning, and it can even have negative effects. Overuse can accelerate tooth wear and potentially cause your gums to recede. So the next time you brush, remember that, like laundry detergent, less is more. Just don't confuse these two. That would be really bad. Number two, soda can. Take a look at that soda can sitting in your fridge. Doesn't matter what kind of beverage it contains. If it's in a can, we're good to go. Give the can a once over from top to bottom. Notice how the top is flawlessly smooth, made of aluminum? To crack it open, you simply slide your finger under the pull tab and lift. The pull tab on a soda can might not seem as flashy as popping off a bottle cap or twisting open a screw cap, but it's a smart piece of design that uses physics to its advantage. The mechanism is set up so that lifting the tab lets the built-up pressure inside the can escape effortlessly. If you're familiar with how a fulcrum works, you'll find opening a can to be a breeze. No need to wrestle with the carbonation. To optimize your soda drinking experience, flip the pull tab around so that the open side is lined up with the can's opening. That's where you'll slide your straw through. Your straw could be plastic, paper, or any other material, even one that bends. Just like that, you're ready to sip away. 
The pull tab also keeps the straw secure, so you can enjoy your drink without any straw chasing shenanigans. Number one, paper toilet seat cover. Even though we all know public toilet seats can be pretty icky, there are items out there that are actually germier. <laughs> Usually, you have two options, either hover over the toilet to sneak in some leg exercise or just give in and sit down when your thighs can't take it anymore. Every now and then you strike gold, a public restroom with toilet seat covers. But there's a catch, they aren't that great at blocking germs and you're likely using them wrong. To get the most germ protection out of that thin sheet of paper, you've got to install it correctly. Here are three pointers to keep in mind. One, don't rip out the middle piece of paper. It serves a purpose. Look for the end of the cover that has small pre-cut tears and pull it out. This flap is designed so that when you flush, it touches the water and gets sucked down. And here's where most folks trip up. It's the front of the toilet, not the back, where the flap should hang down. So the next time you encounter a public toilet, you'll know exactly how to tackle the situation. Have these hacks changed your life? What's your favorite hack of all time? Let us know in the comments below. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next